Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 16, starting at verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. I want to talk about the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel. We just heard a song that said, I surrender all. It says all to Jesus. I surrender and it talks about when you listen to the song and you listen to it, it's to it in its entirety, you listen, you hear it saying, I give everything I have to you, God, give it all to you. Every single thing I got, I want to give it to you. But if you really listen carefully, it's talking about giving everything that you have, because what you have really ain't worth nothing. What you have to give is really not worth. The song is really saying that it's not about what I have to give you, God, but it's really about what you have to give me. And that becomes a fundamental um, um, issue that we deal with in, in the Christian community about we think that is about us giving to God. And the truth of it is that's really far from the truth. It's more about what God has given us. That he's given us his son, that he's given us all power through his son, that the gospel message is about the power that we receive, not from what we give God, but for what God has given us. That's where the power is, not in what we do. And so the power of the gospel, it supplies you and I with the ability to be stable, to be settled. To be convinced that God is responsible and more than capable of working all the stuff out in you and around us. He's more than able to work out all the stuff that we're dealing with internally, but also all the stuff that's going on externally in our lives. He's more than able. That's what the gospel message is. It's about his grace. It's about his presence that fills us up on the inside and he does what we can't do for ourselves. And so... It says it right there. Now unto him that is a power to establish. He has made you. Establish means to settle you. To make you make you uh, uh, convinced. To put you on firm foundation. He settled, Paul says. And by, he said, I'm according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. You can hear a lot of good stuff. And there's a lot of good sayings. And a lot of people that say a lot of good stuff. But unless they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, it has no power. Isn't that what the word says? Now to him that is a power. To establish. We go through a lot of things looking to get kind of power, control. On and we go to a lot of different people and a lot of websites and we go to a lot of different machinations on things trying to get control or trying to have power so that we can make it another day. But the truth of it is, is that you have no power in and of yourself. The only power that you will ever have that will sustain, that will grow, that will move from faith to faith is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. Everything else is counterfeit. And so when Paul opens up Romans and we're going to flip over to chapter one. So and, but when he opens up Romans, it's a time where the Jews are being scattered. It's a time where they're being exiled because what happened was when the gospel started spreading, now they were being kicked out of their towns. They were being run out. It's what I call um, old New Testament or old school gentrification. Anybody ever been in a big city where, where the city became blighted and, and, and nobody wanted to live there and it was nobody, it was, it was vacant and, and there weren't a lot of good things, no shops to go to. And so all of a sudden, but there were a few people living there, but after a while, gentrification happened. They began to run those people out and close up and not have amenities. So people had places to shop and to go and they ran them out of town and they had to go somewhere else only to find out that after they ran them out, they then t- they went in and put money and investment and built up the community. And now you can't even afford it. Anybody ever live in a place like that? I've lived in a couple places. Prostitution on the streets. 
military. I used to live in D.C. when they had back in the day, they had it was the blue light district and they had military tanks sitting up with guns sitting on the tanks along 14th and 16th Street. And they would sit there at night while the street walkers walked the streets and you couldn't you couldn't pay anybody to buy a house. Go there now. A little bitty tiny condo. About a thousand square feet, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars. You can't afford to move in. And this was what was going on. There was gentrification going on and the Jews were being spread. And they just happened to land around in Rome. And here was Paul. Paul's running around and Paul is helping and being responsible. So they're being scattered in all kind of places. And Paul and the disciples are responsible for teaching them about doctrine. Trying to get them to get a firm footing and a foundation about what this whole Jesus movement is all about. And I think one of the things that moved me about this message, I had planned a whole nother message. Remember, I think some of y'all remember I was going to talk about running with the horses. But I thought about it. You can't run with the horses if you don't even know where you're running to and who you're running with. If you don't have a solid doctrinal understanding of what this gospel message is all about, that there's simply power in the gospel. And so Paul was trying to get them ready and, and prepare them. Look, look at Romans. Just start out chapter one. Just turn all the way to the beginning of Romans. Look at Paul's introduction. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Stop right there. I love it because the first thing he says, Paul, I'm a servant. Now, here's what I love about Paul. Now, Paul wrote, wrote half of the New Testament. He's responsible for a lot of people getting saved and churches being established. He is responsible for a lot of things that happened. God used him mightily. The man who persecuted, who persecuted Jews, killed them for a living. Women, children, that was his job and he was proud of it. Here he is now. He's come to the knowledge of who Jesus is in his life. The power of the gospel blinded him on the Damascus road. And now he calls himself a servant. Now, Paul was highly educated. I would say, I would dare to say that Paul probably had a degree in a level of a doctorate. That's how sharp Paul was. And Paul says a servant. Herein lies one of the fundamental problems about who we are as as Christians. We don't want to serve nobody because translation of servant means slave. Paul said a servant of who? Jesus Christ. Called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with what? power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And we just talked about the old idea, the resurrection from the dead, how powerful that when you die, that you actually rise again. Verse five, by whom we have received, look at this, grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So Paul is telling them, he's telling them the doctrine, he's telling the Gentiles who, by the way, are fed up with the polytheism type of religion that was going on in that day. See, in Rome, they, listen, they, they, they left, they left the, the Jewish, they, they were kicked out and ran away because they wanted to worship Jesus. But here they are in Rome and they find themselves in a place in a polytheistic society, a worshiping of many gods, a whole bunch of them. They had all kinds, you name it, they had a God for it. But the problem is they found out that there was no power in any of these gods. After a while, it became a place where they were depressed and oppressed. There was no power. There was no healing. There was no joy. And they were getting fed up with this polytheistic society. And so they decided here was Paul coming around and it was perfect timing because they needed to know that there is a God who can help them with their troubles. And so... Paul knows if he can get this gospel message and get the, get this doctrine down, that their lives will be changed forevermore. If they can only understand what the gospel really means. And I think we made the gospel convoluted. I hope today that we make the gospel simple and that you understand this is basic. All I got to do is walk in it, receive it. But many people try to figure it out and try to try to master it. You can't master the gospel. The master has already done that. All you got to do is receive it. And so, if you'll just receive the message of the gospel, the message of grace, your life will never be the same. The devil, however, works overtime trying to keep your attention 
on yourself and your problems. We're going to talk about that in a minute. He, tra- he works overtime to keep the attention on you and your problems. He knows if he can keep the attention on you instead of Jesus, then he can keep you from experiencing the gospel in its fullness. If he can get you to keep thinking about your problems, your issues, your inadequacies, all the, the, how little money you have, your, your, your depression, your, your, all the stuff that you don't have. If he can keep you on that, then you're not focusing on Jesus, are you? No. That's not part of the gospel. And so he can stop you from experiencing the fullness of what the gospel came to bring. So Paul makes this statement in verse 16. We're going to skip on to verse 16. He makes this statement. I love it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is what the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let me give you point number one. The power of God is the gospel. The power that that sits and, and is in God, it simply is the gospel. And it is the gospel message of grace. The power of God is simply in the gospel. It is the gospel. That is, they are synonymous. Power and gospel go together. And it is this gospel message that we ought to be preaching more that is by grace. Now, I'm going I'm to clean it up because I know you're saying, yeah, okay, I kind of get it. But I'm gonna get, we're, it's going to come home in a minute. But this idea of, of, the, of grace is the idea of wholeness. It's the idea of soundness. It's our idea of health and preservation and victory. That's the idea of grace. Point two. The power of gospel is not just. The power of God is not just in the gospel, which is what it says. Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It says, for it is what the power there it is right there in the scripture. But it's also point two: the power of God is the believing in or on the gospel. Point two is believing in or on the gospel. It's not good enough to know that it is the power. A lot of people, listen, the Bible says that the demons believe and yet tremble. They believe that he is, they know he is power, but they don't really believe and accept him as their own. They don't have the ability to receive God and to know that it is power for them. And so they don't have it. And so a lot of people can know that God has power, but they don't believe. But it is the power of God is the believing in or on the gospel. Is it the words? No, it's the person. See, the gospel is a person. It is the person of what we symbolize grace. And I'm going to show you so that you are clear about what this person and this gospel and this grace and that this person, this gospel and this grace is actually Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8, though, says this for by grace. Look at this. You have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Verse nine, not by works, lest any man could boast. Look, for by grace you have been saved. Now think about it. If by grace you've been saved, is grace an inanimate object? Can an inanimate object save you from distress, destruction? No. Grace, that's Jesus. For by grace, who? Who is grace? Jesus is grace. He's grace personified. And by grace you've been saved where? Through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. He is a gift. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten. It was a gift. It was free. That whosoever should believe shall not perish but have everlasting life. He gave what we could not afford. We couldn't afford Jesus, y'all. That means it was a gift. It was free. We didn't have to pay for it. Point three. The power of God is not just in the gospel. It's not the gospel. Not just that. And it's not just the power of God. It's the believing. But the power of God is in faith toward God. Look at verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The power of God is the gospel. There it is in verse 16. And the power of God is in the believing in or on Christ. As it says in the the latter of verse 16, that for everyone that believes, it's, it's the believing. And then the power of God is in faith toward God. Now, we said that the believing... You say, well, what's the difference in believing your faith? We said that believing in or on the gospel is 
power, the person of grace. It is who he is. It is he is the conduit by which we get saved. For by grace you've been saved. By grace, through grace, through Jesus, we all have been saved. He is the substance. Jesus is grace. That's how we get saved. But it says in 17, righteousness, it says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Righteousness or translation, right living comes by faith. And it uses the term from faith to to faith. This is a way of writing. When they write things like this, they, they emphasize. It's a way of emphasizing in writing. When they say faith to faith, it's to put emphasis on that word saying faith to faith. This is a way that, that, that the word not only um, uh, to bring some, to make a, an emphatic point to it. Like uh, when I grew up, this is what we used to say. Now y'all don't, you know, I'm dating myself, so y'all don't laugh too hard. People would say, now you can say, yo, what's up? Or you can say, hey, yo, yo, what's up? Because when you say, yo, yo, you wouldn't emphasize like, I need you. I'm, I'm calling you over here. Pay attention to me. I got something to say. Yo, yo, what's up? That's what you say. That's, that's what we just say. Not just yo won't go. Yo is like, yo, I'll see you later. But yo, yo meant like, no, nah, we got to talk now. This is like right now. I know I'm dating myself, but that's okay. Some of y'all say yo, yo too. <laughs> y'all did. I ain't that old. We all together. How about that? So what he's saying is faith, faith. He's saying faith, faith. He's saying, listen, this is about, he's simply saying faith alone. Faith all by itself. Nothing more, nothing less. Don't add nothing to it. Don't take nothing away. He's saying, he's saying, listen, faith, faith, meaning it's, that's all it is. Faith alone. It's like saying, he is, he's saying, um, now, now look at the believing part. The believing in verse 16 is a verb. Now, I know y'all didn't come for any educational classes, but it's important because when you get it, you'll see this makes a difference. The believing is a verb. He says, the one to everyone that believes. We believe that Jesus is who Jesus is and that he did for us what he did for us on the cross. It, it, is, it really means to think that something is true. 